We're now going to look at a problem that's an example of a two-dimensional vector calculation. It's important when you look at the problem that you read through very carefully and identify the information that's supplied and exactly what question you're being asked to answer. So pause the video now and read the question very carefully. OK, you've read the question. Now, what is the actual thing that you're asked to calculate here? In this example, it's quite simple. The very last sentence is a straightforward question. It asks what was the average acceleration of this object while the wind was blowing. So we're going to have to calculate an average acceleration, and we need to, from the start, realize that's going to be a vector quantity, that the average acceleration will require a magnitude and a direction. Looking further into the problem, we can see quite a bit of information that's being supplied. Let's highlight some of that. The object, in this case a cyclist, has an initial velocity. It has a speed of 5.5 meters per second moving along a horizontal road. Then something happens, in this case a wind is exerting a force for some time, and then the object has a different velocity. It now has a velocity with a speed of 7 meters per second with a different direction now at 12 degrees to the initial direction. So we can see we've gone from an initial velocity to a final velocity. And additionally, the question tells us how long it took to go between those two velocities. It took one minute. And now we've identified all of the important features in this particular problem. Now, what can we say about the relationship between the thing we're trying to find out, the average acceleration, which I'll write here, as a vector quantity, in terms of the information that's given. Well, our definition of average acceleration is our change in velocity divided by the change in time. And we can see immediately that part of this information we already have. The change in time here is given as one minute. That's how long it took. And we should really write that down in our SI units. In this case, that would be in units of seconds, so one minute being 60 seconds. Now a very good starting point for all of these physics problems is to draw a diagram. Now I'm not going to draw a diagram of a cyclist and a road, that's probably more detail than we need at this point, but because it's a vector problem it's incredibly useful to draw the vectors as arrows and that will help us understand what's going on in the problem. So let's start off with our initial velocity vector, draw it as an arrow like such. We might label that as our initial velocity vi, and we're told it has a magnitude there of 5.5 meters per second. The other velocity we have is the final velocity, which has a magnitude of 7 meters per second, but a different direction. So let's maybe draw that as an arrow that goes along here, 7 meters per second. We'll label it vf, and importantly, it actually makes an angle of 12 degrees to the initial direction, the initial velocity arrow there. Now, to calculate the average acceleration, we need to find the change in velocity. What do we mean by that? We mean the final velocity minus the initial velocity. And of course, divide that by the change in time. Now, what we have to make sure we don't do here, although it might be tempting, is to write down that our change in velocity which is our final minus our initial. We want to make sure, I'll put a big arrow through that, a big line through that, that it's not equal to 7 minus 5.5. That's not the right answer. That's not the right way to calculate. This particular calculation that I've shown here is kind of assuming that we're finding the change in speed, the change in a scalar quantity. But it's very important that it's a change in velocity that's a change in a vector quantity, and so we can't just treat these as simple numbers, simple scalars. So let's get rid of that calculation because that's the wrong one to do. And let's realize that what we really need to do is a vector calculation, taking into account the size and the direction of these vectors. One way to think about that is to use this arrow representation and say, here's the final velocity, and I want to add to that minus the initial velocity. That will be final minus initial. 
So there's my final velocity now. I could add to it the negative of my initial velocity. There's minus my initial velocity as a vector. And in that case, my delta v, my change in velocity, would be the vector that goes from the start of the first to the finish of the last one. There would be delta v. That diagram might be a very useful way if I could draw my arrows very carefully and measure all of my angles correctly. I could actually use that to find the magnitude and direction of delta v. However, I'm not particularly good at drawing and I don't really want to rely upon my ability to measure angles. So although that's a useful diagram to show me the kind of vector I expect delta v to be, I actually won't use that as my calculational tool. What I will do instead is I'll think about the components of these two vectors, vf and vi. And to think about the components, I really should have a set of coordinates here to tell me what direction things are. So let's think of a set of coordinates. Maybe I'll make that direction the positive y direction, and maybe I'll make that direction the positive x direction. And so now I can see for my initial velocity, it's quite easy. It's all in the positive x direction. For my final velocity vector, you can see there's this much of it in the x direction. I might call that vfx. And there's this much of it in the y direction. I might call that component vfy. And now what I want to do is to find the components of my delta v. So my change in velocity delta v in the x direction will be my x component of my final velocity minus my x component of my initial velocity. And my change in velocity in the y direction would be my final velocity y component minus my initial velocity y component. And with these two component equations, one for the x components, one for the y components, I can now just use numbers. These things already have the directions taken into account. So, for example, let's start in the x direction. If I'm looking for the x component of the final velocity, vfx, you can see here in green, that's going to be equal to, it's the side of the triangle adjacent to that angle, it's going to be equal to vf cosine 12 degrees. So I can do my 7 cosine 12 degrees, because 7 is the magnitude of my final velocity, minus the x component of my initial velocity. And again, in this case, that's quite easy. All of my initial velocity is in the x direction. So that's just minus 5.5. And then I can do that calculation, and I wind up with a number of 1.35. And that's a velocity component that will be in meters per second. So that's how much my velocity changed in the x direction. And then I do the same kind of calculation, but now for the components in the y direction. What is my final velocity y component? Again, you can see it's this, this red arrow here, which is the side opposite the 12 degree angle. So that's going to involve vf sine of 12 degrees because the sine function involves the side of the triangle opposite the angle. So now I will have 7 sine 12 degrees, and I've got to subtract off the y component of the initial velocity. But again, my initial velocity is all in the x direction, so the y component there is actually 0. And then this is an even easier calculation to do, and I find that that y component of my change in velocity comes out to be 1.45 meters per second. And now that I know the x component and the y component of delta v, of my change in velocity, I actually have all the information I need. Let's move down the page here a little. So I can draw these two components of delta v. Here would be the x component of delta v, and here would be the y component of delta v. And the vector, vector that I'm looking for, the change in velocity, would be the vector that they add up to. And so there would be my change in velocity vector. Now this, of course, is a, a right angle triangle, so I can, for example, calculate the magnitude of that change in velocity simply by using Pythagoras' theorem. I know that it will equal 
the square root of the sum of the squares. So it's going to be delta v x component squared plus the delta v y component squared, and then I take the square root of that whole thing. And now I use the numbers that I've calculated. That's 1.35 squared plus 1.45 squared, and I take the square root of that. And if I do that calculation, I get a number of 1.98 meters per second. That's how big that change in velocity is. And now remember that my average acceleration is my change in velocity divided by change in time. I can now calculate what the magnitude of my average acceleration is. It's going to equal 1.98 divided by 60, because it was 60 seconds. And that comes out to be 0 0.033 meters per second squared. But I don't stop there because I haven't really answered the entire question yet. Remember, the question asked me to calculate the average acceleration. What I have here is the magnitude of the average acceleration, but I need a direction as well. And one way to describe that might be to calculate the angle that delta V makes with the initial direction. And of course, the direction of the average acceleration is the same as the direction of the change in velocity. So I can see from my diagram here that the tangent of that angle will be delta Vy, the y component of my change in velocity, divided by delta Vx. Or I can calculate that angle by taking the inverse tangent of that ratio. Delta Vy was 1.45, and delta Vx was 1.35, and that turns out to be 47 degrees. So my final answer can be that the average acceleration of this bicycle as it was being pushed by the wind is now going to be 0 0.033 meters per second squared in a direction 47 degrees to the initial direction. And that's the final answer.